And this is Ken Kreitzer for CBSI Services Talking Business, our interview series talking with leaders in the fields of digital marketing, banking, insurance, customer service, and business education. And today we are going to have a chance to talk with Ruth Stevens, who is a, the president of eMarketing Strategies in New York City, also an instructor at New York University and uh, several other universities in the area and also internationally. Ruth, good to see you. How are you doing today? Thanks, Ken. Really glad to be back with you. Always a pleasure. And Ruth, let's start out. You had a very interesting uh, event last week that you spoke with uh, with a group uh, in South America uh, wanting to learn about business-to-business -business marketing, your specialty area. How did that go? It was really terrific. There were about 300 people in the audience. This is the sort of silver lining of the pandemic, you might say, because uh, normally I would be invited to fly to Peru and all the people would leave their offices and attend the physical event. And we spent two hours sort of virtually in Lima talking about B2B marketing. I shared the five must-haves that every B2B marketer needs to be focused on. And there were other people on the, the podium during the two hours who spoke about how to organize your business for maximum impact. And it was just a really nice, nice program. Thanks. Very good. Now, now Ruth, you got to tell us, what, can you uh, just uh, hint at what some of those five keys are to business-to-business -to -business marketing? Yes. Uh, the, the theme was digital marketing, and no surprise, because just about almost everything these days is digital, especially during the pandemic. And I, I made a couple of, I think, important points. One is that while B2B marketers are very likely to put sales lead generation and new account acquisition at the top of their priority list, they should also be focusing on current customer marketing, upselling, cross-selling, retention, referral generation, and otherwise looking for account penetration, account expansion as much or maybe even more as they spend on new account acquisition. Very good. Now, now Ruth, you've been teaching uh, extensively at uh, NYU over over the over the past year uh, and working with your clients. What what is what have you seen? Uh, uh, what have you been working with your clients? What have been some of the comments at your NYU classes over the past six months? Yeah, I I had the amazing opportunity of going back into the classroom last fall at NYU Stern, all distanced and masked, and taught the marketing core course, which is sort of marketing 101 to MBA students. And of course, their main goal is to finish up their MBAs and get a job. <laughs> and you might even argue that business school is partially an employment opportunity service. <laughs> but the, when it comes to marketing, they were particularly interested in, in, in topics like pricing, like digital communications. They had all seen the Social Dilemma movie and wanted to discuss that. They were very concerned, of course, about where, you know, when they would be able to get back to their social lives. One of the great things about going to graduate school, of course, is building relationships and and um, having some fun <laughs> with your peers. So that was an area of, of great interest for them too. So I'm actually planning, well, hoping to plan one day when we're all able to get back together socially to invite that class over for a drink on my rooftop or something because we, um, while we spent many hours together, I, I, I feel like I'd, I'd really like to have some social time with them too. Absolutely, and this has been a challenging time for, for, for every business. Uh, uh, many of us, uh, the shift to work at home and uh, for others, uh, 
the challenge of serving customers uh, uh, for restaurants and retail. Uh, what have been some of the areas that you've recommended to your uh, to your clientele about uh, uh, the needs to pivot during uh, this COVID-19 pandemic? Well, one big area is of business events, of course. And I thought B2B marketers were actually very clever, inventive, and adaptive in the spring of last year when they realized that they couldn't attend their trade shows and conferences as expected. And they really quickly migrated to virtual events and thereafter very quickly realized what works and what doesn't work. And what, what we quickly learned is that trying to replicate the exact experience of a trade show, for example, in a virtual environment is, is, is really not the right strategy. Instead, we should be thinking of it more like a television production. And, the, and what I've been advising my clients in, that, in the area of events is to create small peer-to-peer -peer groupings, kind of mini conferences, maybe 45 minutes or an hour long, all invitation only, where one of your sales executives can maybe serve as moderator and you invite four or five prospects or current customers and the attraction for them is that they get to talk with their peers about difficult challenges and share ideas and of course the the benefit for the seller is that they can either deepen relationships um, or establish new ones and maybe introduce new product ideas or service ideas in an, an engaging environment. So I, I think Very there's good. still a lot we can do with, with uh, virtual events. We've only scratched the surface. And I also think it's one of the key areas that post pandemic uh, will, will be part of the marketing mix going forward because it's, it's turning out to be really effective in some areas. Yeah, our, our friend Don Neal uh, from 360 Live Marketing uh, Live Media uh, is talking about the new hybrid conference, which is going to be partly online and partly in person as uh, one of the areas going forward. And certainly, uh, we're seeing that uh, conferences that are online can can uh, reach a, a, a different market of people who might not have the opportunity to travel. And so you can sometimes go deeper into organizations that, that you're trying to, uh, to reach. So uh, really a, a big Agreed. change there. And uh, I guess uh, the other area we're looking at is working at home. You know, in our company, we're, we've been uh, working from home since uh, middle of last March. And it looks like uh, that, you know, that's going to continue uh, for some time. And, and maybe uh, more companies are going to be uh, looking at working a couple of days a week at home for people. How do you see the work at home changing the way uh, uh, corporations and companies are going to work uh, uh, going forward? Hasn't it been an interesting journey, Ken? There is nothing more intimate. Well, maybe there is, but it is certainly a different level of relationship when you're chatting with a business prospect or, or a current customer and you see their spouses and children in the background and all their private, you know, uh, home life there right, uh, right in the conversation. And that allows a, a deeper relationship, which is, you know, that, Businesses, business to business marketing is about relationships. So um, I think that's a sort of a, a benefit in a way. But there are also some interesting data implications, meaning we now need to find our customers at home. And uh, we, for, for one thing, their IP addresses are no longer connected to their firms. So we have to use pretty sophisticated technology to find them through digital channels. And that's uh, driven the explosion of interest in identity resolution and, and uh, the identity graph database that underlies it. And, but we also want to take efforts to append consumer data to our business records. 
that means you know uh, their home addresses maybe and um, things about uh, information about their personal interests and this is actually pretty easy to do today lots of companies will take your business records and and uh, identify match it up to that individual as a on, on the consumer side and append it so I think the the, the opportunities have, uh, th there are many challenges, but there are also many opportunities. And uh, Ruth Stevens, uh, you are a uh, prolific writer and you've got another <laughs> article out. Your LinkedIn page has got a tremendous amount of, uh, of content uh, uh, with uh, uh, monthly articles. One recent one is seven practical workarounds for business to business multi-channel attribution. <laughs> and again, it goes into the subject of, of uh, what advertising, uh, what direct mail, what promotion leads to new business. Tell us a little bit about some of the points in your article. Thank you. And it's, the title is a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry. But I, I wanted to share some really practical ways that you can actually connect a marketing investment here with a closed deal at the end and sometimes that process can take as long as 18 to 24 months in in a complex selling environment it certainly involves a lot of parties the way business buying is most often done is with a, a buying circle or a buying group so we need to to not only try to influence those people but it makes it very complicated for us to understand which of those outbound touches or inbound connections was was impactful on the the eventual sale so marketers have struggled with this for years and thinking about the multi-touch multi-channel multi-buyer involvement um, it, it you might be you might be touching that account a hundred times or more before they sign the the purchase order <laughs> and uh, attributing any one of those touches to a particular marketing um, result uh, or I'm sorry and and anytime you're trying to claim credit for that sale sales result to one of those many touches is really fraught so i i wanted to suggest some workarounds that can allow you to to connect a sale with a marketing touch so one of the the most obvious ones from the era of database marketing and mail order is the concept known as data matchback where once the the sale has taken place you then look back at the various touches th that contributed to the sale and uh, the, looking at the, um, the, the history and then assigning some kind of credit to all of those touches, for example. And the, so the seven ideas each has some, some benefits, each has some challenges, but I, I hope it'll help a little bit. I, let me just mention that the last of the ideas is don't bother <laughs> to put it uh, colloquially actually I'm, I'm saying um, once the lead has been handed over to a salesperson for a close then that's the end of the marketers responsibility so let's try to measure everything up to that point and forget about whether the lead closed or not for marketing investment purposes at, at which point you could be calculating a metric like the cost per qualified lead and um, setting up say a b split tests to identify the power of any given offer or challenge uh, channel or or what other variables and i know you mentioned uh, that one of one of the ways to check uh sources of new business is simply to survey new customers and say what attracted you to the company was it an an advertisement was something that drove you drove them to the website was it it's something else in uh email or direct mail that that uh generated the uh, the uh the lead 
is there, is there any media today that you're you're working with your clients on? I know uh, people are, are concerned about email saturation um, and uh, seminars and webinars and um, but there are still ads out on the Super Bowl driving customers or prospects to websites. What what do you see working today? Well, in business to business, there's pretty much a standard toolkit of marketing media. You have to have a website that is informative and uh, engaging and establishes you not only as a trusted business partner, a thought leader, uh, but also as a, um, as a, a company that you feel comfortable with as a buyer. Um, you also need to be investing in search engine advertising, search engine optimization, and uh, then, then the rest of the toolkit is really, uh, there's a, a, a huge mix of opportunities available. So, uh, social media advertising, like sponsored posts, have been become very productive in the last several years, not only on the tried and true standard business channel, namely LinkedIn, but also even on Instagram and um, YouTube and uh, Facebook, believe it or not, the our business buyers are there. We need to be there too. So um, but your point about email, it's remarkable how many business sellers rely almost exclusively on email as their outbound marketing channel, which just slays me because we all know there are corporate filters they have to get through. There's the delete key they have to get past. And if a prospect has never heard of you, they're, they're, it's very unlikely that they're going to open and, and read your message. I think we marketers are, uh, are subject to being accused of being a bit lazy because uh, our marketing automation tools like, you know, Marketo and um, other, you know, message management systems are, are built on the assumption that the outbound message is going to be through email. So we sort of use that as the default and neglect other channels, I think, at, at our, our peril. Absolutely. Well, how, how do you feel now about uh, webinars? Uh, there's a, a, a shift of conferences to webinars, shorter formats, usually 45 to 60 minutes uh, as a way of introducing uh, companies and, uh, and, uh, and uh, individuals. Uh, uh, some people are uncomfortable about doing that. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think about the value of representing companies in the webinar format? They work. Same with podcasts that have recently taken a, a huge upward uh, swing. And uh, video, it, it, whether it's embedded in social posts or just uh, on your website or on, on YouTube, uh, these channels are working. So I say, you know, try it. And if it works for you, keep, keep using it. And Ruth, uh, you are the author of uh, at least three tech, three major texts on business to business marketing, uh, data driven marketing, maximizing lead generation, and then a third text trade show and event marketing. I know you got a secret project you're working on for another text, uh, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what, what's a key point from one of your books that's, uh, you know, really top of mind uh, today. Well, uh, one that has been facing all of us this year is the, the quality and completeness of our customer data. And my most recent book, it's actually already five years old, but um, I, it's my most recent is B2B Data-Driven Marketing, where, by the way, um, I have a website for that book, b2bdatadrivenmarketing.com, where visitors can download the first two chapters if, if they'd like to take a look at the book. It's also available uh, for Kindle on Amazon. But enough of my sales pitch. The point I wanted to make is that the, uh, the, the shortcomings of our marketing data are hitting us in the face. And 
have been for a long time. And I think there's a psychological point that we should be aware of, which is that a lot of marketers get into the field because they're interested in messaging, in creativity, in ideas, in connection with customers. And they're about the softer side of marketing and and the harder side, like the or harder in the sense, not more difficult, but harder in the sense of more kind of, well, shall I say it, math, <laughs> it, uh, which is where the data piece lives, is somehow uh, unappealing to many marketers or maybe even frightening. So one of the points I like to make is that we need to get over any hesitancy we have about responsibility for our customer information um, and also and get into it and actually embrace it and own it and instead of delegating responsibility for it to a data administrator over over here somewhere that we marketers need to understand what is in our marketing database or our CRM system what is the customer record look like what data elements are missing that are really important to us, like the title and the job role, the direct dial phone number and other important data elements. And if we deem those essential to have, especially for our top customers, then let's go get it usually by hand or through data append. But this kind of uh, interest in the data and responsibility for it, to, you know, uh, realizing that it's not somebody else's job, it's my job, is a, a psychological uh, mind change that I think is, is worth considering on the part of many marketers today. Very good, and Ruth Stevens, president of eMarketing Strategies, past president of the Direct Marketing uh, Club of New York, instructor at uh, NYU Stern. Uh, I know you got a class you're preparing for, uh, perhaps a, a final thought for us today? Thanks. Yeah, well, I, I think that the business to business market is changing so rapidly, but our customers still need us. And uh, the, the ability to reach our customers and prospects to understand their needs, to serve those needs and continue to deepen the relationship is the job of B2B marketing. So I hope your, your listeners have picked up a few ideas and thanks again for the opportunity to talk with you, Ken. Absolutely, and uh, Ruth Stevens, uh, uh, always a, a pleasure to talk with you, hear about what you're teaching and, and hearing from your students at NYU and also uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, international speaking and teaching opportunities that you have had. And uh, we will look forward to doing this again very soon. And again, uh, this is Ken Kreitzer for CBSI Services, Talking Business, our interview program. All to highlight the great work of our team at CBSI in Harris in New York. We provide insurance-based benefits and customer service management to the credit card and payments industry. Thank you again, Ruth Stevens, uh, and we'll look forward to doing this again. This is Ken Kreitzer for CBSI Services from my home office today in White Plains, New York. Have a great day, everybody.